Okay, let's jump straight in. High energy today. We're comparing ketamine and etomidate for rapid sequence intubation. That's right. The idea is really just to pull out the key differences, uh, the similarities to okay. help you make those clinical calls. First up, hemodynamics. Right. Blood pressure effects. Always a big one. Right. So etomidate, it's often, you know, liked because it tends to keep blood pressure pretty stable during the actual intubation, causes less of an immediate drop. Which makes sense why it's often used for patients who are, well, already unstable, trauma, maybe shock. Exactly. You get more predictable stability right then and there. Now, ketamine, it can support blood pressure. It has sympathomimetic effects, increases heart rate, cardiac output. But uh, there was a specific warning sign with ketamine in the info we looked at. Yes, exactly. This is important. If you have a patient who's really critically ill, their stress response is basically exhausted. Uh, catecholamine depleted, is the term ketamine, can actually make their blood pressure fall. So etomidate generally gives you maybe more consistent stability right during the procedure. Okay, so stability during intubation leans etomidate. Though I think the material suggested ketamine might reduce the need for pressors after intubation sometimes. That's noted as a possibility, yeah. But let's switch gears to something pretty unique to etomidate, adrenal suppression. Ah, yes. This is a major point of difference, isn't it? It really is. Etomidate inhibits the enzyme needed to make cortisol. And that suppression, it can last for several days. Several days. So if you have a patient, say, with sepsis or in shock, they really need that cortisol response. Exactly. Interfering with that can be problematic. It's a serious consideration. And ketamine. Ketamine doesn't do that. Yeah. No adrenal suppression. So it's generally seen as safer from that perspective, especially if you're worried about adrenal issues or expect a long need for vasopressors. Okay. Zooming out a bit, what about the ultimate outcomes? Survival, organ dysfunction. Does the choice matter there? Well, what the data we reviewed shows pretty consistently is uh, no significant difference between the two for overall mortality. Really? No difference in survival? Not a significant one, no. And rates of organ dysfunction look similar as well. Both seem effective in terms of patient survival after the airway is secured. Even though there were maybe some hints that ketamine might have a slight edge in specific groups, but not strong evidence. Precisely. Not strong up on its own to make a blanket recommendation. It really comes back to the individual. Okay, what about getting the tube in first time? First pass, success. Yeah, does the drug choice affect how likely you are to succeed on the first try? The information indicates no significant difference there either. Ketamine and Atomidate provide similar conditions for first pass success. So success there is more about other things. Much more about provider skill, experience, the patient's anatomy, getting the dursing right, preparation, not so much the induction agent itself. All right, let's connect this for the clinician listening. How do these points help you decide at the bedside? Okay, so if you're faced with, say, major trauma or undifferentiated shock, someone really hemodynamically fragile, Atomidate's stability during induction is a definite plus. But you have to keep that adrenal issue in mind, especially well, sepsis. Absolutely. Caution is needed there. And when would ketamine maybe be the better choice? Ketamine's got those bronchodilating properties, so for patients with asthma or severe reactive airway disease, it can be really helpful. Ah, the airway benefits. Yes. And also in traumatic brain injury, maintaining cerebral perfusion pressure is vital, and ketamine often helps with that. Good points. Any specific cautions with ketamine, though? Yes, because it ramps up heart rate and myocardial oxygen demand, you need to be careful using it in patients with known significant coronary artery disease or uh, active cardiac ischemia. Okay, so let's try to sum this up. Both are effective agents for rapid sequence intubation, that's clear. And there's no definitive mortality benefit for one over the other based on current evidence. Etomidate gives you that immediate hemodynamic stability, generally, but carry the risk of adrenal suppression. While ketamine avoids the adrenal problem, offers potential airway and cerebral blood flow benefits, but its blood pressure effect can be, well, variable. It depends heavily on the patient's state. So the bottom line seems to be tailoring the choice. Absolutely. It's about looking at your specific patient, their condition, their other health problems, and what you need to achieve right now. Which leaves you, the provider, with this thought. Mm -hmm. How do you weigh that immediate need for hemodynamic stability against the potential downstream risk of adrenal suppression from etomidate, something that could affect the patient for days? That's the clinical judgment call. 